Is it time for a mind shift? If you don't know what that means, then join your host, Dr. Clint Haycock, a former evangelical Christian pastor and Bible college teacher of over 20 years, along the journey of deconstruction and reconstruction of faith, life, religion, and spirituality. I'm so happy to welcome back returning guest, one of my very good friends, Frank Schaefer. So welcome back, Frank, to Mindship Podcast. It's very good to see you again, Frank. I can't believe it's been, what, another couple of years since we talked last. How How is that? I can't, I can't remember when, when it was, but we've we've talked often enough. So they sort of, these conversations merge. <laughs> it seemed like they happened a little while ago. And then on top of that, we keep revisiting the same issues because the, the conversations you know, unfortunately, over the last number of years have circled around again and again and again to the whole issue of the Christian nationalist rise, the Trump presidency, the part my family played in laying the foundation for some of these things, unfortunately, in the 1970s and 80s. So, I, you know, I wish we could just move on and be done with this and talk about the house that you've got <laughs> fixing up because we're both, you know, into renovation and stuff. That would be that's true. More fun, yeah, or, what, or, or Wrexham, you know, because you you went to a Wrexham game the other day, and I'm a big fan of Welcome to Wrexham, the, the series. So you're there in North Wales, right where that's all happening. That's true. As I was saying before we hit record, we went to the Wrexham match the other week. We ra- ran into Rob McElhaney on the streets of Wrexham, you know. So I, I lived about ten minutes outside of Wrexham. I didn't go say hi to him. My girlfriend was kept saying, "You got to go say hi to him." You know, you're a fellow American. Yeah, uh, now he's trying to film. He's trying to, you know, I just, I took a picture, put it on social media, and I thought it was going to go viral, but it didn't. Are they, are they in the middle of making another season, as I'm sure their their documentary yeah. is continuing? That's it, because as we're doing this recording now, it's near the end of their season, but there'll be a new season three, I think, coming out on Disney+, Plus, which will be, cr- you know, chronicling this season right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, at this point, they're pretty close to being promoted, so hopefully they'll stay up in the top two or three spots. So yeah, and you were saying an eye on maybe 10, 10 games left and they're yes. close promotion again, which is great. They go up to the next level. That's true, but it is a big jump. I mean, it, there was a big jump from the, you know, the league they were in before now right. to the league they're in, you know, so it's going to cost more money and all the rest of it. But I, I'm excited for what they've done to Wrexham. Cause like I said, I live about 10 minutes outside of Wrexham. It's really put the city of Wrexham on the map. Yeah, it's a strange thing because it's. But are you seeing there. are you seeing changes in the town, as in it's getting cleaned yeah. up and le- less depressed, <laughs> less depressed? It's, it's had a long history for sure. I mean, you, you obviously you watch the series; it goes back. It's a very industrial town, a lot of coal mining, and yeah, there was, there was a lot of tragedies that happened in the history of Wrexham. I think it's brought a lot of pride back to this to the city. Yeah, you know, and yeah, it has changed. They're putting money into it. Uh, we had Prince William in town the other day. King Charles came for a visit last year. You know, that was on the series as well. Sure. Uh, so he filled up at the petrol station where I go get my fuel, you know, so I didn't see him, but, you know, I thought, well, hey, if King Charles can pop in, you know, why not? Yeah. <laughs> hey, well, you know, I, I happen to know the area, not the Wrexham area, but I think I mentioned to you, I was in a boarding school in Flandern. No. Yeah. Well, you're saying is about 45 minutes toward the coast from where you are. Yes. The Great Orms had all that stuff. So mm-hmm. that, that bit of the countryside, you know, M- Mount Snowden, we used to go on these Carnarvon Castle. You know, there's a lot of things that I remember from the area. Oh, yes. And, uh, but bleak up there, you know, the Great Orms had no trees, just windswept, a few mm-hmm. pirate coves and, yeah. and the Irish Sea and all the rest. I just have very strong visual memories and also the feeling of that kind of you know, those overcast, cold, windy days on the North Wales coast. And then I did know it would be a summer resort for a while in the summers, people would come. But I was never there then. I was always on my vacation. So I got bleak, cold <laughs> Wales. That's typical British weather, though, isn't it? But yeah, it, it was an old, it's an old Victorian resort town. So there's some stunning hotels that are still there from the 19th century, as you probably yeah. all remember. It's got a nice pier that goes out into the ocean. It, it is a great place to visit. Yeah, well, you know, we we would go kayaking, ocean kayaking in mm-hmm. the winter in Wales. Oh, oh, 
you know, that for anybody who knows the area, they know I'm tough because I would get in that water. We did not have wetsuits. No. Yeah. So we we were out there kayaking in the waves in the winter. Um, You know, this was all par for the course in an all boys school. Mm. But um, it always left me with the feeling whenever I hear the words Clendidno, I don't think summer and gracious hotels. I think, (laughs) you know, dragging my kayak out of the out of the surf, freezing cold. It's true. It's so cold. Yeah, because we used to have a, a caravan, like a, a mobile home type thing, right up right up the coast from Planet yeah. of No. My God, you'd go on the water for ten or fifteen minutes. You couldn't even feel your feet. You know, it's, and that was in the summertime. You know, it's bloody yeah. cold. They're in the Irish Sea, but it is a beautiful place to live. It, it kind of goes back to some of the stuff you talked about. I think in your other book, you know, where you wrote it during the COVID lockdown. It's it's like learning to appreciate a good quality of life. That's why I've stayed yeah. over here. I've got my citizenship. I'm never going back to America. I'm an yeah. expat, you know, because I think the quality of life is so much better here. Yeah. And that's yeah, why I've well, stayed. You're, and you're, you know, and, but, but you've got your American friends salvaging Wrexham's <laughs> yeah, football team. True. So, you know, hey, there's something to be said for American money. That's you're, right. There's, yeah, they're not turning it down. That's for sure. in Wrexham. Yeah. Well, that's all the past, isn't it? I mean, that goes back to your story, you know, growing up at Labrie and then ended up kind of getting shoved in boarding school here in Clendano. But I mean, how did it all happen? I mean, that, like you said, why can't we talk about something else? But it, the reason I reached out to you is because you have so much to say. I mean, you've been to doing your videos on Facebook, warning about Trumpism, warning about the evangelical right. Yeah. Why can't we just leave this alone? Yeah. But the thing is, you know, I, I, I think there's something you and I have not really discussed perhaps enough mm. is the shift within evangelicalism itself to the point where you almost have to redefine the term because these people are now claiming to be Christian nationalists and evangelicals that the polls show that less and less of them are actually attending church, less and less of them actually know anything about Christianity, this they this is a, a political label now that is being worn by people who are evangelical or former evangelical, but an increasing number of people who are just using this as a shorthand for right wing white Republican MAGA mm-hmm. politics. And the evangelicals, of course, keep playing to that because their big conferences at places like CPAC and these other things, you know, feature as keynote speakers, all these Republican candidates and commentators. So now, you know, it's, you can't really talk about the Republican party or the evangelical movement as separate things. And you can't really talk about evangelicals being influenced by Trump or Trump trying to follow their playbook. This is all now one thing. And so I think that time is now gone when you could talk evangelicals back into a different political position based on what, for instance, you would interpret as what Christianity actually teaches. Mm. This is a non-starter now. There is no conscience to appeal to because the movement has become so hard-assed and so dedicated to this view that they now don't even identify with democracy. Basically, if an election works to put us in power, fine. If it doesn't, we don't care what the rules are, and it's illegitimate by the very nature that we didn't win. And so I think the big change is that also now the gloves have come off in describing not just Democrats, but liberal people or those who differ with evangelicals essentially as demonic. So it's been taken out of the realm of politics and put into kind of a holy war, yeah, good versus evil. So you, you have two things going on that are kind of counterintuitively contradict each other, but they work together. One is the D, yeah, you could call it sort of the de-religiousizing of evangelicalism into a pure political movement. And then on the other hand, the language of that movement is to use the terminology of demonic possession, spiritual struggle against principalities and powers, all this language, so that they talk about politics in spiritual spiritual terms that are non-political and simply reduce it to a, between good and evil. And of course, when you get there, then niceties like constitutional law, the rule of law, democracy, how our government should work, separation of powers, these all become minor inconveniences to just be bulldozed through. 
by loading the courts with judges who will back you by doing these various things. And then you have, you know, the evangelicals pushing for certain things, but you also have groups like the Heritage Foundation that have been playing a long game for 50 years to seed the courts with people sympathetic to their point of view. So, you know, we're in a strange position now because you and I have been familiar with this movement for a long time. We're actually living through the end game right now. And it's a winner, it's a winner take all. It, it it's no yeah. longer it's no longer saying, hey, if we're not careful, this is where it will go. Yeah, we're there. It's a zero yeah. sum game, isn't it? And the point of no return was passed a long time ago. I think so. But yeah, we've talked about this so many times. You know, you and your famous father, Francis, you have a part to play in the story because I've been going through Francis Fitzgerald's book, The Evangelicals, The Struggle to Shape America. And it's a the what I appreciate about what she does, it's a long book, but she goes through it. She she just traces the story. It's this narrative, right? And you and your dad are mentioned in it during the early, you know, nascent rise of the Christian right in the nineteen seventies. Yeah, trying to get people to get on board with this idea of, you know, taking a stand against abortion with your film, whatever happened to the human race, right? Or it was a series, I guess, wasn't it? So yeah, she talks yeah. about that. So along I mean, with Doctor C. Everett Coop, who was the Surgeon General, yeah, to that. And they were chipping away. Once they, once the evangelical right got this idea that, yes, abortion is one of our main planks in the platform, they were mm-hmm. chipping away at it for, they had been ch- chipping away at it for decades. But like you said, they changed strategy now to where, I remember there was a quote in the book. She says, Dr. James Dobson was giving a speech. This was during the George W. Bush presidency. Yeah. And he said, we can't go after the courts. They're, they're out of touch. We, you know, they're, they're untouchable. We don't have any say. That's not true anymore, is it? They no, have to completely been reversed. The, and the thing is, the difference between then and now is that our kind of best of all worlds wish list, which we never thought could be achieved, always left us as outsiders. Well, the courts can never be touched. The liberals mm-hmm. have taken over. Actually, now, you know, the thing, the really big change is we were outsiders banging on the door asking for, to be noticed and to be catered to by politicians up to a point. You know, who could have envisaged a day where the Speaker of the House is, quote unquote, one of us mm-hmm. and a theocrat, yep. a, a reconstructionist who doesn't even like the Constitution of the United States because he wants America governed by biblical law and says, well, if you want to know what I believe about politics, read the Bible. Well, <laughs> that's not your usual <laughs> answer. It used to be, you know, I'm, I've sworn to uphold the Constitution of the United States. And that's not the case anymore with this group. So their internal memoranda to each other, as it were, is basically how do we get rid of this inconvenient political document with its roots in the French Enlightenment, talking about liberty and, and human rights, when you know our roots are in the book of Leviticus and Exodus and the Old Testament and the law. And we basically find this democracy stuff gets in the way of what we really want to do. Um, and that's a real change because back in the day, that was not my dad's message. My mess- the, His message was very much, how do we work within the system to change it? And then when he wrote a Christian manifesto, he sort of went to the next level of saying, if we can't change it by democratic means, then you know we, we should use whatever means would have been legitimate to overthrow Roe v. Wade and the abortion regime, as he would have put it. Uh, that would have, say, been legitimate to overthrow Hitler in the 1930s. So he he elevated that part of the fight. But now, you know, where Dad ended in 1982-83 with his last book is kind of where these guys just start, mm-hmm. and they go from there. And it's that 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 horse is long out of the barn. I mean, basically, we're <laughs> not talking about democracy. It is an anti-democratic movement, isn't it? And that's what's so striking about going through this book by Fitzgerald is that how she lays it out. And what strikes me is that, that, like you say, you and your dad, when I was an evangelical, I remember I went back and listened to one of the podcasts we did a few years ago. Yeah. We were talking about your dad, how influential he was on me when I was an evangelical doing a master's degree, talking about, you know, Paul's sermon on Mars Hill and Acts 17. And it was all about engaging the culture. That's what I found. His message was it had such resonance for me. We could actually be a Christian and listen to secular music, but it was with a view to let's quote lyrics to the non-Christians to show how cool we are and how in tune yeah, we are. Engage the culture. They're searching for God. They just didn't know it. You know, look at that. Look at the lyrics to these songs and look at the movie yeah. themes. You know, what happened to that? Because we've, like you said, that's so, 
you know, 25, 30, 40 years ago. Yeah. How did it end up getting to be like it is now, an anti-democratic thing? Yeah, but it's gone one step further, and and this is not a new thought, Clint. I think we've sort of touched on this, but I, I yeah. clearly, since we last talked, several things have happened. Uh, first of all, the war in Ukraine mm. has meant that the evangelical right-wing Christian nationalists have clearly come out, not just in favor of defunding our helping Ukraine, they have come out in favor of Vladimir Putin as a man standing, in their view, for traditional Christian values against gay rights, yep. feminism, and all these other things. So since we last talked, I know we didn't get into this. We've gone from being anti-constitutional and pro-biblical law theocracy. We've talked about that. Yeah. What we have not talked about yet, but we're about to because I'm bringing it up, mm -hmm. is that even in the short time of a year and a half or so since we last did a podcast together, we've taken a step to the point where now the evangelical white nationalist movement, not only having taken over the Republican Party, but they have now adopted Trump's point of view, which is that Vladimir Putin, the sworn enemy of the West and democracy, is more important and a better friend to him than NATO is. Yeah. So, you know, we've taken we've taken the next step of going to a position where the Christian nationalist movement within the United States is not just anti-democratic, it's anti-American. Mm. Yeah, it's a dangerous and, movement. It really is, isn't it? Yeah, and in a way that the last time I saw anything like this, and it was certainly not a movement, it was just a few individuals. When you think of Jane Fonda going to Hanoi and siding with the Viet Cong against the U.S. in the Vietnam War as the kind of final iteration of her protest, not just being against the war, but some members of the Tet left took the next step and became pro-North Vietnam and anti-American. But they were an offshoot. They did not even represent the Democratic Party, let alone the left. These were individual that we would have regarded as sort of the next step out or extreme and so forth. You've got a whole movement now within the religious right, led by people like Tucker Carlson and Donald Trump and all these figures, that is now actually siding with the enemies of the United States and Western democracy and NATO mm. against our country. They're not just about defunding American support of Ukraine. They want Vladimir Putin to win and, in the words of Donald Trump, do whatever he wants with the NATO countries. Because in Trump's book, Putin and he and the religious right are on the same side, and that is they're reacting against not just democracy, but our concept of human rights and these other things that include gay rights and feminism and other things. And that's new. That's new since we last talked. This is just happening now. They're not even pretending anymore to be on the side of the United States. And that's shocking because the Republican Party was always about national defense and it was always about strength. It was always about patriotism. These guys aren't even pretending. So the funny thing is the religious right, the white Christian nationalist movement has gone further than the mainstream liberals and the anti-Vietnam movement went, they they called for peace, but most left-wing anti-Vietnam war protesters were not on the side of the Viet Cong hoping for our defeat. Mm. So they said, this is the wrong war, we shouldn't be here, but they, they were not cheering from the sidelines for North Vietnam to not only defeat us in the South and and get America out of the war, these guys on the religious right have gone further. They not only want Putin to win in Ukraine, they're hoping he rolls across Western Europe and turns all of it into an authoritarian state mirrored on something like Hungary with Viktor Orban, mm -hmm. who's crushing democratic rights there. Yeah. And so there's a, there's, a th there's a thread in this that the mainstream media hardly dares go to, because when you start naming this, when you talk about fifth columns and so forth and so on. Sounds a little crazy and paranoid, but actually in this case, it's not. These guys really want America, just they want America to no longer be a democracy. They want an authoritarian model. 
They like what Vladimir Putin's doing. So when Navalny is murdered in a Siberian prison and his body is not given back to his mom after he's being tortured and killed and, and persecuted because he wants democracy, evangelical Christians are on the side of the people who killed him. So that if this was 1933, they're not only doing what Lindbergh and Ford did in their anti-Semitism and told, telling us to stay out of the war in Europe. They're taking the next side. They are on the side of Hitler and the Nazis saying, we hope they win. It is no less extreme than that. Yeah, so the, exactly what happened. Yeah, the religious right, you know, I, you know, I'm repeating myself, but this is worth repeating. Yeah, it's that important. You have to understand, this is, a, this is an unprecedented step. There is a major American political party of two major parties that is now literally anti-American and siding for the victory of Russia in Ukraine. They're not just not going to fund it. The people running the party, taking their cue from Putin and, and Trump, are actually anti-American, and they're hoping we are defeated because they like these people's form of government better than they like ours. They want a strong man like Putin working with him. So, you know, if you picture the access of World War II, Japan and Italy and Russia, I mean, and Germany, that then turned around and talk, to attacked Russia at that point, it is as if they want us to become a member of the Russian-Chinese access of authoritarianism. Mm. They would like America to become more like Russia and China and less like ourselves, because when we're ourselves, they could lose free and fair elections, and they don't want to. They'd rather just have a strong man in power for life. And I'm not exaggerating this. This is what mm. Trump has become. Oh, yeah. He's, he's not even bothering to hide his authoritarian rhetoric. No. And that was the thing I noticed a few years ago where... A lot of evangelical leaders were starting to idolize Putin, and I'm like, wait a minute, hang, hang on a minute, and they were cloaking it in the guise of, well, after the Soviet Union collapsed, Putin let these mission organizations and Christian organizations into the former Soviet Union, so this is a great thing. Plus, like you said, he's pro-family, he's anti-LGBTQ, yeah. he's a strong man, he's a Christian, a Russian Christian nationalist. In, With in, the backing of his church. Yeah. And so- and then, and Trump, Trump, Moscow yeah, and all the rest. Exactly. And Trump obviously idolizes, like you say, the strong man, the Bolsonaro's, the the yeah. Erdogan's, uh, you know, the Putin's of the world. He wants to be that. And now <laughs> he's saying, I'll be a I'll be a dictator, but only for Yeah, but the day. thing is, the thing is, if anybody thinks this is just talk between, you know, Clint and Frank Schaefer, I just want to offer you one thing. Where's the funding for Ukraine? Right. Where's that right money? Now it's being held up, and we're we're watching them starting to lose towns. We're mm -hmm. watching them starting to lose this war, and we're doing nothing about it. And it's only taken one year to reverse the support of the United States for them to the point where our president, President Biden, has been made ineffectual by the Republican House mm -hmm. that is now reflecting the will of their constituency. And it isn't a question of just having a an isolationist vision. This is what people don't get. This is not just an isolationist vision that says, well, it didn't go so well in Iraq and, and, and Afghanistan, and we don't want to overextend, and let's not pay for this in foreign wars. That's a traditional isolationism. This is something different. They're on the side of people who want to destroy us, and they share their values. CPAC goes to Hungary, and has meetings with Orban. Yeah. And, and Tucker Carlson goes and interviews Putin so we can get his side of it. And there's literally no difference, literally no difference between this and someone, say, in 1935, yeah. going doing a show with Hitler at the Reichstag and coming back and showing Americans that, saying, well, uh, you know, let's hear his point of view. So, we, you know, we, this is this is new territory. We've never had a whole political party siding with the enemy, not the enemies, the enemy of the yeah. United States. And as this guy's threatening they, to nuke us. Yeah, because they admire his strongman type of government. And they and admire his Christian stand against yeah. the liberal enemy. Yep, yeah. and he's ruthless about it, as you say. I mean, 
here in this country in Britain, I mean, how many people has he killed, expats, Russians, or yeah. attempted to kill? And the British government has done basically nothing about it. Yeah. I mean, over in Salisbury, we had the Skripal poisoning. You know, he, these, he sent agents over here and they gave him Novichok, tried to kill him. Yeah. Nothing ever came of that. You know, yeah. so when it comes to standing up to Putin, the West is, they have a miserable track record. Terrible. And Germany funded the entire war in Ukraine just by buying all his natural gas for the last 20 yeah. years, making a handsome profit. And we've gotten exactly what we deserve, but that in no way changes the fact that at this moment when push comes to shove and Biden's trying to do something about it and show some American leadership, you know, again, for anybody who's more than 12 years old, the party of national defense used to be the Republican Party. You remember this. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I was a staunch Republican. what they cared about. They they accused Democrats of being weak on defense. <laughs> that was the call. And now it is Republicans are not just weak on defense. They're on the side of Vladimir Putin. It's madness. And Trump is saying, hey, NATO is not our friend. Do whatever you want with them. Yeah, I remember that was the quote. He said it was in one of his campaign rallies the other day, wasn't he? He said something to the effect that you alluded to it. If NATO doesn't pay their bills, which was a common theme when he was president, they're not right. paying their fair share. I'll let Russia do whatever the hell they want if I get elected president, if right. NATO doesn't pay their bills. And, and he's getting cheered for that. Yeah, he's getting yeah. cheered for that by, by people who are re profoundly and terminally stupid because, of course, what they don't realize is politics aside, hello, Russia is actually a real enemy. Yeah. Real so enemy. Naples in started a war in Ukraine where thousands of people are being killed. And, you know, if you care about your own security and safety in the West for no other reason than self preservation, you do not want Vladimir Putin on the march through the planet, mm -hmm. finding the next people who pick off. And of course, he's in Central Africa now. Mm. And he's all over the place. This is, a, the, you know, this is exactly, it's not kind of like, it is exactly the playbook that Hitler used in the 1930s. Mm -hmm. What he can get away with, a march into the, you know, student land, and then I'll take the whole of Czechoslovakia, and I'll do here, and I'll do that. And then, uh, you know, at the same time as the British were beginning to stand up to him, people both in our State Department, Joseph Kennedy, our ambassador, was siding with Hitler, you know, as was Lord Halifax in Britain on the side of, of trying to make peace with Germany. We've seen this playbook before. We will be right back in just a few minutes in the second half of this conversation with Frank Schaefer. We're going to be getting more into why this is the end game for these Trump mega evangelical white supporters, the base of Donald Trump. And I want to get Frank's prediction on what he thinks will happen in the run up to and including the presidential election here at the end of this year. This is going to be a potentially violent situation and we'll get his responses there. But I wanted to bring you up to speed on what's coming up here in the next few episodes. I've mentioned last time, I've got a lot of episodes that I've been able to record. I've had a lot of people contact me. I've contacted some people, and that means I've got a lot of episodes already recorded in the can. The next one up is going to be with Jonathan Davis. He's a former Bible college teacher, former seminary professor like me, who's now walked away from it all. We've also got Sarah McCammon, as well as Marissa Hackett, who grew up in a right-wing cult. But we're going to take a break after Jonathan Davis. We're going to put an episode in there with my good friend Jenny Cohn. She writes a lot for the Bucks County Beacon, and I feel like this one really needs to be shoved to the front of the queue, kind of like this one with Frank Schaefer. This is a really important topic running up to the 2024 election. We are going to be specifically talking about Project 2025, and I mentioned that in this episode with Frank, but with Jenny, she's been doing a lot of writing for the Bucks County Beacon. And she's been focusing on Project 2025. If you don't know what that is, I'm also going to be doing a special Patreon-only exclusive episode just on Project 2025. I've been doing a ton of research on it. The more I get into it, the more frightening it gets. So it's going to be a long episode on Project 2025. But we've got some good stuff in the pipeline. So keep in mind those are coming up here in the next couple of months. And then I've got some other interesting news, a couple of things. One is I'm going to be changing the name of this show over the last year or so, I've come to realize that there are just too many shows called Mindship Podcasts, including an education podcast. There's a couple of Christian ones. There's a couple of other ones out there. And my show, I think, is getting lost in the mix, and it doesn't really reflect 
what I'm doing. So in the next couple of months, I'm going to be changing the name of the show. So I'm working on a couple of different potential titles for the show. So keep an eye on that. Also, the other thing I've been working with my good friend, Tim Sledge, I'm editing my book. I'm going through now chapter by chapter by chapter. As of this recording, we've gone through three chapters and we're doing about one or two a week. So we're making progress on it. Once all the final edits are done, this book will be released. And provisionally, I can think I can say the title now. I've changed it. It used to be Baptism, Third Times a Charm. But going back and forth with Tim, we realized that that probably isn't the best title for it. So we're going to be calling it Not So Happy, Not So Shiny People, How I Lost a Lifetime of Christian Faith or something along those lines. So I will let you know when the book is ready to go. It'll be released on Amazon as a Kindle version. Then I'm also going to be working on doing it as an Audible book as well. So I've been looking into what actually it takes to record a file that works for Audible. And I think I've got it figured out. So that's a lot of work. But when it comes to your own book, I think you definitely should do your own narration. It makes it a bit better if the actual author is the one reading the book. So that's another project that I'll hopefully be working on over the summer. And then the final piece of news, I wanted to give a thank you to the latest members of the Mindship Podcast Patreon community. We have Ruth Parkinson and Abby Tiger. Thank you both Ruth and Abby for joining as supporters of the show. If you want to support the show financially, that is always appreciated. And the links to that, as always, are included in the show notes if you want to find out how to support the show and also become a member of our closed Mindshift Podcast Facebook group. And then speaking of Patreon, we have actually in the month of April, we've got Ren Story coming back. We always do these Mindshift Podcast Zoom calls once a month, usually about the third Sunday of the month. And I've reached out to Ren and she was just on the show a couple of weeks ago. And I'm really excited to announce that she is going to be our guest on the next Mindship podcast, Zoom calls, you have a chance to meet the people that I've talked to, people that I've interviewed. And so this is a great benefit that you get for being a Patreon supporter of the show. All right, let's get on back into the second half of this chat with my good friend, Frank Schaefer, as we look at this issue of Trump's MAGA army. Why exactly are they playing the end game? Well, Trump's using, he, he plays the dictator's playbook, doesn't he? I mean, yeah. that's the thing. Everything he's saying in this this current campaign that he's going to do, you know, yeah. going after the media, weaponize the Department of Justice, go after his political enemies. These are all straight out of the dictator's playbook. Exactly what Putin's done. And he envies him the ability to just lock people up in Siberia and kill them. Yeah. And no, nothing ever happens. Well, on, yeah. kind, of, kind of on a related note, uh, I've seen this happen. This is a crazy thing. What's going on in Israel at Gaza right now? There's obviously a lot of protests against maybe how how too far Israel has gone in sure. Gaza, but I've seen now people. Yes, they could criticize what Israel's doing, but they're actually now turning and becoming Holocaust deniers. They're they're so you know anti-Zionism right. that they're saying, well, the Holocaust didn't happen. Wait a minute, that that's a similar kind of a shift, isn't it? To go yeah. from yes, you're free to criticize what Israel's doing in Gaza. But how do you go from that to becoming a Holocaust denier? <laughs> you know, that's your similar kind of a shift, isn't it? What's so interesting is that the evangelical Christians want to support Israel for reasons of their own vision of prophecy of Jesus coming back and so forth. It has nothing yes. to do with supporting Jews. It has to do with their own apocalyptic vision. But then on the sort of a youthful left, you know, very similar to the Christian nationalists who want Putin to win, it's like there's a whole generation of people on the on the left in terms of young people in universities on one side who would consider themselves as very different than the evangelicals supporting Trump. But the fact of the matter is they all have one thing in common. In one way or another, they are united in having turned away from the West and turning toward what is literally our historical enemy. It makes no because sense. if you look at the history of Islam, for instance, it's the you know they were at the gates of Vienna. It's conquest all the way down, and always has been. Mm. I mean, there, there have never. I know this sounds controversial these days, but there have never been Islamic missionaries anywhere. It's always been conquest. Christianity was by conquest too, with the conquistadors oh, sure. and the rest. But there was also missionary efforts, rightly or wrongly, that tried to convince people by argument and not by force. So, the fact that that level of naivete about Putin. And the naivete about, you know, what has happened in terms of historically with the, the conquest of the West by Islam, there's a generation of people who literally deny history. 
So they deny history when it comes to Putin from the Christian nationalists. And we're denying history in terms of of just this high watermark that again and again and again was beating on the shores of Western democracies and civilization uh, and just the West in general um, from the Islamic world, you know, the fall of Constantinople, the Persian Empire, the Ottoman Empire, you know, these are not these are not imaginary things. These were all military attempts at world domination and conquest. So it's odd to me that on the left you have young people with a soft spot for world domination and conquest um, from a series of Islamic empires, which overlap. And then on the right, this kind of soft spot for world domination and global conquest by Russia. And and of course, you know, for me, I, I'm someone that is ready to look at all the sins of the West and talk about them and try to change ourselves and improve ourselves. But I'm still someone who believes in the basic truths of the Enlightenment, for instance, and the what came out of the Renaissance in terms of turning to science instead of to superstition. You know, these are gifts. And the fact that there are people on the left who find them suspicious because they were discovered and or invented by white people or people on the right who side with Putin because he hates gay people as much as they do, they are all mistaken because this is all we've got. You know, the West is where we live. And so, you know, and of course, there's a tremendous hypocrisy there because when you call on the international community to do something about Gaza, who are the international community? It's a handful of Western countries and nobody else ever steps up anyway. Mm-hmm. And, and and the same thing with Vladimir Putin. You know, you call, you, you talk about Vladimir Putin. Well, you take the United States out of the picture and Russia just rolls across Europe and everybody knows that. And so... It's not like this is negotiable stuff and there's two different ways you can look at it and it's an abstract political opinion. You know, there's a much more fundamental opinion that I would ask the Christian nationalists and and the people who seem to be siding with Hamas in some weird way. And that is, hold on a second. You know, you're not living on another planet. You live here. Mm. Would you like to propose an alternative to Western democracy that where you want to be? Mm-hmm. And you want to move to Chad? Do you want to move to, um, you know, where? show me where on the North African map you'd rather be living than in a Western democracy. Show me who's doing better within the Soviet bloc that turned into modern Russia that's still more like the Soviet bloc. And at a certain point, I just feel that People don't have the guts to face the reality of our human situation, which is never perfection. It's always doing the best we can with what we've got. Mm. What we've got is Western democracy, if we can keep it. Yeah, exactly. If, if what's left of what's so crazy about this whole storied line now is, as we're saying, the Christian right is actually helping Trump to become that authoritarian. Because, you know, going back to the history of it, one of the things that struck me from Fitzgerald's book. You know, she goes through Jerry Falwell and Pat Roberts, and these guys were early founders of the, what became the Christian right. But what was striking about it was guys like Paul Weirich and, and Richard Vigore and other people, they were going after their audience. That's what they wanted. That's what became the base, this mm-hmm. now Trump's base, the audiences of Jerry Falwell and the 700 Club and all these TV preachers and all that. But by the time you get to the 1990s, I didn't know this, but I, re- I just read this today in the book that Dr. James Dobson focused on the Family Family Research Council. He was so powerful politically. There was a few times where when the Republican Party wasn't doing what he thought they should be doing in terms of anti-LGBTQ uh, legislation, pro-family, anti-abortion stuff, he threatened to quit the Republican Party. And he said, I'm going to take as many voters as I can with me. So he had that much power. Yeah. They caved into him. Now, sure. Yeah, you get to Project 2025. This is something that's funded, organized by the Heritage Foundation, which you rem- right. which you mentioned. And I'm just reading from this, uh, their website, Project 2025. It says, quote, the 2025 presidential transition project. And they're talking about helping Trump become the, the next president. Being organized by the Heritage Foundation, it builds off of Heritage longstanding mandate for leadership. Now, this is scary which has been highly influential for presidential administrations since the Reagan era. Yeah, it has. Most recently, the Trump administration relied heavily on heritage mandates 
or policy guidance embracing nearly two-thirds of Heritage's proposals within just one year in office. So they're already, they're saying, look, Trump was using most of our stuff the yeah. first year he was president, and they're going to help him become a dictator. And this is the Christian right doing this. Yeah, and the thing is, as they turn against the U.S. and pro-Putin, which means that part of his agenda will be to strengthen Russia and to get us out of the business of, for instance, sanctions and other things that would somewhat curb what Russia can do, while also turning against NATO. Um, you know, you begin to add that up, and then again, going back to the American left and the the you know the the protests over the war in Gaza. When you add those two things together, for someone who actually is grateful to be living within a strong Western democracy, whether it's you sitting in Wales in the United Kingdom or me in the U.S., you know we have one thing in common. This is the only system we've got. And when the right has turned against it and is pro-Putin, led by Trump and the Heritage Foundation, and the left basically is whitewashing the entire history of Islamic aggression against the West, mm -hmm. there's no way to get rid of that in history. That's the story. They weren't at the gates of Vienna for a picnic twice and just... <laughs> yeah. They wanted to destroy Western Europe as understood and turn it into an Islamic part of the uh, caliphate. That yep. was their vision. They did it to North Africa. And I would just ask people who look at that or how things are going in Ukraine. And, you know, the basic unanswered question from the left and right these days is, well, how did that work out for you? Mm. Yeah, I mean, how did you, that work you, out? You really want to live in an Islamic Republic run by the likes of ISIS or the Taliban? You don't? Then be careful because, you know, you're coming close to supporting a vision which you certainly don't want to live under. And yeah. that irony doesn't, is not made very clear. And then I think the same thing happens to people on the right. You know, you do have any idea what it's like to be an average citizen in Russia? Do you really want to be stripped of a voice and killed if you offend the Trump family? Mm -hmm. This is not an exaggeration. This is what yeah. Russia is. If you, a Trump, if you offend the Putin family, you are dead. Ask, the, you know, any yeah. distant of only. Yeah. And and this this is where we're really at. So people don't like speaking in harsh terms like this because, you know, we get this kind of constant stream of stuff from social media, influencers, cute little videos, whatever, to keep a keep us sort of passive as it were. But the really big strokes are, you know, this really is nineteen thirty three. We really are making decisions that will shape our future. And and the left is distracted by being anti-Western, anti-white, anti-enlightenment because it comes from a part of culture that they regard now as the oppressor class. That's what they're against. And there's some truth in what they say. And then on the right, on the right, their whole view is, well, we like Putin better than our own government. We want something like this and Trump will do it. So my question to everybody is, okay, what remains? then who defends the way of life we now have where you mm -hmm. go to a soccer game in Wrexham and enjoy that, you know, uh, not having to worry about, well, you'll put on this podcast with me. You're not going to be dragged out of your home and killed in the United Kingdom right now because you're living in a Western country mm -hmm. with all its faults. Yeah, it's not perfect. No, and the UK was responsible for big chunks of the slave trade and all the rest of it. Yeah. The matter is, Realism. all sorts of stuff all the way down because the human race is awful. But, but you know, my question to everyone on the left and right is, where would you rather be living? And I don't want to be in Beijing instead of New England. I don't want to yeah. be in Vladimir Putin's prisons instead of free to speak here with you today. Hmm. I do not want to be in Gaza run by Hamas with tunnels under all my hospitals and schools hiding behind civilians as an international terror organization. Let's not, let's just strip off all the nice talk and look at the basics here. And so I don't find people on the left ready to do that openly. And I don't find people on the right ready to do that. And I don't find a moral equivalence there because the right is what's endangering us far more now. Mm -hmm. The left is just fuzzy and silly. 
but the right is it's got a program and things like the well-funded heritage foundation with a 50-year program that they're well into now oh yeah yeah going and back now, and now they have captured they have captured the federal court because the federalists yep. gave the heritage foundation and the federalists gave trump a list of judges that are now backing the program mm-hmm how ironic, yeah, when I heard Dob- Dobson say that in the 1990s, you know, we can't touch the courts. We can't go after the courts. They're out of our reach. That ain't true anymore. No, they well, got them. Yeah, they've got them. And like you said, they just handed a, a list of judges to try. He didn't know anybody. He didn't care. Yeah. He just making a campaign promise to somebody. Yeah, 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 sure, whatever. You guys got me elected. I'll, I'll put these people in power or put them on the bench all the way up to the Supreme Court. And now we're seeing the fruits of that coming into play with his, you know, some of the trials that he's having. The Supreme Court's delaying his immunity question, you know, and he's taken that as a big win, you know. So whether or not that comes down, I don't know. But, you know, here's a guy. Any, anybody, anybody who thinks that this is hyperbole and says, well, come on, that's an exaggeration. I just want to ask you something. Five years ago, if I told you that Roe was going to be reversed. Excuse me. Ten years ago, if I told you the Republican Party would be would be saying, "Let's give in to Vladimir Putin and hand him Europe," yeah. Excuse me. Yeah, you couldn't make you, you this don't stuff think, up. You don't think that the next steps will be equally shocking and more so? Mm. You're crazy. This is this is an irreversible path where the right is, where the right is basically bowing to Vladimir Putin and the totalitarian Eastern Bloc what we used to call the Eastern Bloc. Um, when it comes to China and Taiwan, the same thing will happen. We'll find all of a sudden that the right wing is on the side of, of the Communist Party because basically it too is authoritarian and anti-gay. And, and, then, and then in terms of the left, the left is not going to fill the vacuum because they're too busy with the niceties of kind of a political correct view of the world which demands perfection or nothing and always gets nothing. Mm-hmm. Because that's, that is, that's the disease of the left. We demand perfection or nothing. Well, you will get nothing. And, you know, in the same way that Vladimir Putin is no joke, you know, if you think the shape of the globe the Saudis want is one you want to live in, mm. be my guest. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're playing for keeps now. Yeah. Us, the, we're hurtling on this train toward the cliff. And the question is, are there any brakes left anymore? Can we even right. apply the brakes? Well, I know you got to go, but I do have one last question for you. A friend of mine, I was doing a podcast with him a couple of months ago, and I asked him, what's your prediction for the 2024 election? And he said, okay, there's three outcomes, and I want I want to throw these off you and see what you think. He said, number one, yeah. Trump wins. And then you talk about what happens if that's the case. Number two, Biden wins the popular election, but Trump doesn't accept that result. Then number three, it's so close that it goes to like a Bush Gore type situation where it was like tied up in the courts for months and months and months. Are those the three possible scenarios that you think could happen? And if if so, what's what what would what would be the outcome of all three of those? Well, I would take I would look at this a different way, and I would just say exactly the same thing I said a minute ago about the unthinkableness of where we are when it mm-hmm. comes to imagining that a major American party, the Republicans, are now on the side of our sworn enemy mm-hmm. that has aimed thousands of nuclear weapons at the United States, one button push away from our annihilation. We're on his side. That unthinkableness, and then the unthinkableness of a naive left which insists on everything or nothing, and in looking at the reaction to what's going on in Gaza, is now ready to demonize the entire Western idea of alliance and standing for democracy in this simplistic version of, you know, brown and black are good, white is always oppressive, um, Mm. the oppressor class and so forth. And I just ask again, well, who is defending democracy? Who is defending the West? Who is admitting the truth about the global impact of authoritarian, you know, monarchy and Islam and all the rest of it as being really our enemies for for since the seventh century? Mm. You know, they, we okay. So now I want to take your three scenarios and look at them the same. Let's just stop and consider for the, a moment for anybody who's been alive more than two minutes. 
that these are three rational predictions that an election is won and not accepted again, mm. that it's so close it goes to a, a biased, loaded Supreme Court to settle yeah. in favor of a dictator. Yes. The very fact that you, the very fact that I didn't laugh mm. 15 years ago, if you had said, these are the only scenarios ahead, I would yeah. say, crazy, Clint, of course it can be. It, it's, yeah. So there's another way, surely. There's another way. It'll work, you know. Um, not so much. I'm not, I'm not a roll back to say Eisenhower or Nixon or Clinton, and say, you know, what do you think happens in the next election with with, with you know whomever you want to put in? The, you're not going to be rolling those scenarios out. So I would say, of course, I can't pick what will happen. The very fact that one of them probably will happen is outrageous. Mm-hmm. You know, so if it was a medical situation, it's like normal, hey, you need a knee replacement. and But all of a sudden, no, no, we're only talking about should we unplug the patient. I mean, this is a much higher stakes game than normal medical questions. Well, similarly, nationally, we're talking about the West caving to, you know, a well-financed, globally militant Islamic movement that has always conquered by the sword. Mm -hmm. you know, while they're still doing public beheadings in Saudi Arabia and, and having women raped in jail who ask for rights, while at the same time putting billions into tennis and golf and all the other sports. And we're just sitting here going, okay, well, you know, let's concentrate on um, the oppressor class in Israel and never mind the man behind the curtain and what's really going on. And I think mm -hmm. the same thing now with Russia. You know, we're not talking a pretend enemy here. This is Vladimir Putin we're talking about. He has you killed if he doesn't like you. Yeah, literally. Okay. If you dare to speak out, you're, you're yeah, probably so marked. What I would just say is the context in which you bring up your scenarios for a U.S. election is not some neutral context of business as usual. You know, we are in a crisis. And sadly, it coincides with a crisis of Western confidence in our own system. So the left sees us as part of the oppressor class and the right, you know, hates the left, but also sees us as the problem. And both agree on one thing, and that is their loyalty to our system is really in question. Mm. So you yeah. have left wing people who don't like what's going on in Gaza sitting out an election. And all I can say is, you know, you idiots, if you help put Vladimir Putin in power via Trump in Europe and yeah. you help put Trump in power via sitting out the election because there's some part of Biden's agenda you don't agree with. <clears throat> you know, I'm just sad I'll be stuck with all of you while we all pay the consequences. Yeah. Someone's got to pay the me, price. Believe me, the first people in the U.S. that Trump will settle scores with are people he hates bitterly, and that is the Islamic minority. Mm -hmm. he will be coming for you. Yeah, and, well... And coming for you, like, up and to, including deportation. Yeah, mass roundups and... Mass roundups and yeah. so forth. So, you know, have fun in Michigan sitting out the election and weakening the Biden presidency. Just wait mm -hmm. to help put Trump back in power. Yeah. You know, you, you this is a man who believes that you are third-class citizens and deserve to be treated as such, if at all. Yeah. Well, look at, I mean, Stephen Miller, he's part of this project 2025. He's written that part on a so-called immigration crisis and whatever. And he said that basically, yeah, there will be mass roundups on pretty much day one. People yeah. are going to be deported. Hispanics, Latinx, anyone who's in the country, quote unquote, illegally is they're gone. You know, and that, like you said, the Muslim, uh, Muslim ban, that didn't get, that didn't work the first time he tried it. But he's like, the difference this time, he's saying, I'm not going to be putting these these people that disagree with me and off, I'm going to put yes men and women from day one. They will not be disagreeing. Right. I, will, I won't be going and firing people. I'm going to be having yes men and women around me that are going to kowtow to everything I say. I'm not making that mistake again. Well, part of the Trump program from the beginning has been a hatred of the Islamic community. Yeah. So there could be nothing more ironic than the Islamic community sitting out an election and helping elect this guy who will turn around and smash you in the face. Yeah. I don't know. Biden, oh. Biden will defend your rights because he believes in the Constitution. Yeah. Trump doesn't. Yeah. Well, the problem with all three of those scenarios, none of them ends well, does it? 
even if Biden wins, we pro Trump's primed his base to not to accept the results of the of a free and fair election. There isn't anything as such a thing as a free and fair election in their view. It's the whole system is rigged. It was rigged. Trump should have won the first time. He did win. Blah 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 blah. They they've swallowed the big lie hook line and sinker, and <laughs> they're still pushing it. He's still pushing it. Yeah, I mean the only the only good result, and it will be imperfect, would be a big enough Biden win. Yeah, so that we begin to look at Trump and MAGA as has beens, and they begin to fade from view very much as certain groups in the 1930s faded from view once we actually went to war with the Nazis and. All of a sudden, Henry Ford and Lindbergh and the pro-Nazis and the anti-Semites were shutting up. They were yeah. still there. They were running our State Department, which was very anti-Semitic and so forth. But the the balance tilted. But you know, we're, we've got this twin pincer movement of naivete on the left and utter, you know, stu moronic anti-American stupidity on the right. This is kind of new. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because in in World War II, the pro-Nazi sympathizers were basically on the right. And the left had some traditional pacifism in it to keep us out of the war. But it, now, you know, the U.S. itself and our constitution and our way of life on the left is being denounced as part of the oppressor class white supremacist thing. And from the right is being denounced as standing in the way of a Christian nationalism that elevates family values and puts gay people in their place and so forth. And I would just like to say, well, what's what's left of the middle ground at this point? Mm. Yeah, it's been trampled and there's not much left. Yeah. Well, I know you have to go, but um, I, I love talking to you. I, I, why do we always say this? Why is it so long in between the time? If you do come to Wrexham, we'll go out. We'll have a pint. Yes. Yes, we'll take you to a, a football match. Uh, we'll, maybe we'll run into Ryan and Rob in town. Yeah, we got to do that. I'd like the world to write so you can come stay at my new house. It's all been done up. So thank you so much, Frank. I know you have to go, but I, I just always love talking to you. I wish yeah. you all the best, and let's keep in touch. I'm a I'm friend of your podcast. Thanks.